Let's talk about what we see when we see our bodies in the mirror. We're in a series called With New Eyes, where we're speaking about having a redeemed worldview, fixing the way that we see things. And today's talk is entitled Temple Ethics, the way we see the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Bible speaks about our bodies as being a temple of the Holy Spirit. So how do we see our bodies correctly? Adam and Eve seemed perfectly happy to wander around naked with their bodies without shame, without thinking incorrectly about them. And I think as we're born, we come into, we, we are not born with that sort of shame. Our, one of our children has got a birthmark and he has been perfectly comfortable with it for years. And then all of a sudden, one day he wasn't. All of a sudden, one day he was ashamed. What is it that came in and distorted his view of his own body? What is it that comes in and distorts our views of our bodies that make us expect perfection of them and be disappointed when they are unable to present a flawless identity to the world on our behalf? What is it that makes us abuse our bodies, that makes us harm them, that makes us hate them? We seem to have a strange love-hate relationship with our bodies who, when we are Christians, have become temples of the Holy Spirit. And I think the first thing that is really important is that we need to acknowledge that our worldview in this area, the way that we see our bodies, is very often distorted. As I open up saying, what do we see when we see ourselves in the mirror? So often what we see is not what God sees. That our, our vision can be so distorted in this area. And unless we acknowledge that there's a brokenness to the way that we're seeing our bodies, the way that we're seeing other people's bodies around us, that perhaps we're looking with lust or incorrectly or judgmentally, that there is a brokenness within the way that we see it. Unless we acknowledge that, we are unable to fix it. And so I want to acknowledge before you, giving you permission to acknowledge it as well, that I have been broken in the way that I've seen my own body as a teenager and as a developing young woman, as I became a young mom, the way that I treated my body, the way what I have sometimes expected of my body, these things have been distorted and broken. They haven't always been the way that God would choose for me to see my body and the way that God would choose for me to see those around us. We want to see ourselves rightly. As 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? But not just that, we do also want to see others rightly too. My view of my body can also affect the way I view other people's bodies. The scripture has said we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Not the temple of the Holy Spirit, but a temple of the Holy Spirit. We share this templeness with each other. Together, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 to 14 speaks about this togetherness, that we are a body and when we are united, that is what the Holy Spirit dwells in as a temple. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Growing up, I was taught not to air my dirty laundry, not to uh, tell others what I was experiencing, problems at home or things within my own life, my own personal life, not to um, share about them in public. And perhaps you had the same experience. And I think I have overcompensated sometimes by oversharing, by wanting to say, no, I want to be a Christian. I want to be able to be connected. I want to be united with other people. And so oversharing and being vulnerable to the point of sometimes breaking confidentiality. And yet I have confidentiality with myself, I mean, things that I don't need to expose about myself. And I learned recently that in the journey of addiction, the way that uh, people are counseled here in Anthem Recovery, that they're counseled along a path of understanding that vulnerability is not opposed to confidentiality. That as uh, people are taking on a journey of recovering from addiction, they, are some, they have to become vulnerable. They have to open up their lives. We have to open up our lives to those around us. 
but that doesn't always mean that all confidentiality is lost, that we have to expose exactly, in this case, what drug was used or how, or where it exactly came from. There is a degree of confidentiality people are allowed to preserve in their journey of vulnerability. And while that is incredible wisdom and allows us the freedom to step into vulnerability, when it comes to mental and emotional sin, we are able to do that to a degree. But when it comes to sins against our body, often confidentiality is a privilege that we don't get to experience anymore. Not because somebody else is taken, taking our confidentiality from us, but because our body exposes our sin in a way that is incredibly difficult and often comes with a lot of shame. When our eyes are bloodshot or our nose is red, when our pants don't fit anymore and there is, everybody can see that. When we are struggling with eating disorders and our cheeks are gaunt and our clothes are falling off of us, everybody can see it. So what do we do with that in the church? What do we do with the fact that we're wanting people to be vulnerable? We're wanting to be one. We're wanting to join together. But sometimes people are coming into vulnerability, coming into community with no confidentiality. They have been stripped of their, um, their right to be able to share their sin just with a few because of the way their sin has affected their body. What do we do with that? And I want to carry on that scripture that I was reading in 1 Corinthians 12. It continues in verse 21 like this. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Those within our body who are able to present themselves to each other, come into community without compromising their confidentiality, need to make sure that they don't lord it over those of us who have weaknesses that are exposed, sins and struggles that are exposed to one another. We need to treat those that are exposed with greater modesty, with greater sensitivity, with greater kindness when their confidentiality has been compromised. I just want to take a moment to say well done to those of you within Anthem, within our community, who have stood up and put up your hand and said, I need help. I need help and my confidentiality is exposed and yet I'm going to choose vulnerability anyway. I'm going to choose to say that I need help with eating disorders. I need help with addictions. I need help with taking care of my body. Well done and keep pushing in. And may we together be a body that makes it okay for that to happen, that is kind and treats each other with modesty and with greater compassion and sensitivity when people are hurting and their hurt and their suffering is exposed to ours. I want to speak a little bit about an allegory of what we have when, as a person, as a human. We're born, um, there's this allegory of speaking about our soul as a country, the country of man's soul. And it is a beautiful country with endless diversity, something that we're, it's as if we're all born into a wonderful estate when we're born human, that there is endless possibilities. There, we can never explore the bounds. It is an unmappable country because of the bounds, the boundaries that just can never be reached of the, um, the possibilities that we have endless treasure within us to be mined, treasure that it has incredible value, that there is uh, places of worship within us where we can meet God, there are libraries where we can uh, be exposed to education, that there's this incredible country within us and there are servants within this country as God equips us and gives us this land of our bodies, that he gives us servants to help govern our bodies, that perhaps if you like our, our will is the prime minister it is able to uh, to be in charge of the other servants of our body and perhaps our appetites can be thought of as lower servants we have
have an appetite for food called hunger. We have an appetite called thirst. We have an appetite for restlessness. We want to get up and get going. We want to do exercise. We want to be busy. And we have an appetite for rest. We uh, naturally will feel tired. We'll need to sit down and take a break and read a book or even better, have a good night's sleep. And yet these appetites, these servants of our soul can become tyrants that sometimes over time, either because perhaps they haven't been well trained by our parents when we were young or through various reasons, various things that we've gone through, these appetites that are supposed to be servants can rise up as tyrants and start to take over our lives, take over this country of man's soul if they're not well governed. And so hunger can turn to gluttony where instead of being a good servant telling us when to eat what we need, we can start to become fussy and we can start to overindulge and uh, give in to hunger and allow hunger to be raised up in a position in our lives where it shouldn't be. And it's not good as an ultimate ruler. It turns us into gluttons that are just always thinking about food, that we don't just think about it at meal times, but in between as well. Thirst as well can be um, corrupted and distorted and become drunkenness where we thirst instead of after pure cool water, we start to thirst after alcohol and after drinks and things that will destroy our own souls and even the countries around us, the people around us. And similarly with restlessness, if we are too restless, instead of being something that drives us to work and play well, it's something that allows us to never be settled or that forces us to never be settled and want to always be on the go and it can take over and be a very hard taskmaster in our lives of these countries that we're trying to govern. And rest as well seems harmless so that when we feel tired we'd want to lie down and rest and yet if we give ourselves to rest as a ruler we, it turns into sloth that corrupts and becomes a poor leader. And so what do we do when our countries are uh, just being ruled by these tyrants that were meant to be servants, meant to be servants to the prime minister of our world? And I want to turn to the scriptures. There's a story that I'm, it just jumped out at me, whether or not this is exactly what it was meaning, but I thought it, it made sense to me and helped me to understand it. And so I want to share it with you. It's a story of David, the same David who killed Goliath when he was young, killed the giant. Um, this young man, he has promised a kingdom, just as we've been given the kingdom of our own our own lives, the country of man's soul. Uh, he was promised a kingdom and yet his kingdom is being ruled by Saul at this time in the story. And Saul is trying to kill David. He doesn't want to hand the kingdom over to David. He doesn't want David to be able to rule over the kingdom that has been promised him. And so Saul is chasing David and running after him and trying to kill him. And where does David go? But he runs straight to the house of God. He runs straight to the temple and he approaches the high priest in the temple and he says, help me. I am on a quest. I need to, I'm, I'm on a journey, but for this journey, I'm ill-equipped. I don't have what it takes for my journey. I need food. I need, I'm, I've, I've left without any weapons. I've got nothing to fight, to protect myself or even to sustain myself. Can you help? And that's where I want to pick up. I'm going to read it to you from there. Uh, 1 Samuel 21, verses 6 to 9. So the priest, that's the high priest, gave him the holy bread. For there was no bread there, but the bread of the presence. He didn't have ordinary bread, so he had to give David the holy bread, the bread of the presence, which is removed from before the Lord to be placed by hot, replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day. So Saul, who's trying to kill him, there is a spy there, detained before the Lord. His name was Doeg, the Edomite, the chief of Saul's herdsmen. And then David said to Ahimelech, the, the high priest, Then have you not here a spear or a sword at hand? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And the priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, for there is none but that here. And David said, there is none like that. Give it to me. I want to point out here that David was looking for provision for his journey. He was looking for protection for his journey in his journey to come into his own kingdom. 
And he has given so much more than just bread and a weapon. He has given the bread of the presence. He's given the bread of the presence of God. As we come to the house of God and say, I need help for my journey to come into my own kingdom, to come into the country of man's soul, there is the bread of the presence of God to walk with us. Not just provision for our bodies, but provision for our spirits that will strengthen us on the journey. Also, he's not given any other weapon, but he's given the weapon that was held by a giant that was there, that was his enemy. This very weapon that was in his enemy's hand to destroy him is given to him into his hand so that he is able to protect himself. And even furthermore, I want to point out that this priest who gave David the presence and the weapon that had been in the hands of his enemy, this priest died for what he had done. Saul heard about it and put this priest and 85 of his family members to death for doing this for David. And it just reminds me of the fact that we have a high, have a high priest as we come into the house of God, needing help for this journey of coming into our own kingdom. That there is provision in the sense of the bread of his presence, that we can eat of his presence and be sustained. That there is provision in the sense of the very sword, the very things that have been in the hands of our enemy to destroy us, are put into our hands as things that we can use to protect us and to fight for our kingdom. And that it is all done at the cost of the life of the high priest. Jesus says that he is our high priest and he has given his life so that we can uh, have our souls restored to us, so that we can have our kingdoms redeemed and bought back and given over to become his kingdom, that he becomes the king of our soul and we govern it on his behalf. So this is what Jesus has done on our behalf. This is what the high priest has done on our behalf. And you notice that Doeg, they, there is a person here watching over what the priest is doing and watching over what David receives. And he is the one that ends up telling what the priest did, that ends up getting the priest killed. And even as we come into this journey, there are those who are not only judging us, as we're trying to uh, take control of our bodies, trying to conquer the tyrants and the rulers of gluttony and drunkenness and restlessness and sloth within us. They are those that are judging us and they are those that are judging the priests that would die on our behalf. There are those that are judging Jesus and saying his grace is scandalous. It's too much. We should be punished. We should be called out for our sin. But I want you to know Jesus sees your sin. It's not okay to let your body be ruled by those tyrants. It's not okay. But Jesus will die for you to be rescued from that place, for you to be given the governance of your body again. And there are those who think that his grace is scandalous, that it's too much, that he shouldn't uh, be so kind to us when we've allowed our countries to get out of control. But Jesus does it anyway. In fact, Jesus speaks into this very story, this very moment um, that David came to the temple when Jesus, many thousands of years later, is then walking with his disciples and teaching them he too is judged for the way that he is uh, leading and, and working with his disciples. Listen here in Matthew 12 verses 1 to 8. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and they began to pluck heads of grain to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they weren't allowed to do that according to the Pharisees, pull uh, the grain because that was considered work in the Pharisees' eyes. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to Jesus, to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. And Jesus responded to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? He's pointing out that there's inconsistencies to the way that uh, the Pharisees are wanting him to, to run his disciples and to, for the Sabbath to be observed. He's showing them that they are so interested in rules and laws that they're forgetting love and kindness. They're forgetting that this priest was okay. His heart was towards providing for David in that moment. That Jesus' heart is towards providing for you in this 
moment. And that is the kind of Lord that we serve. And sometimes the church is unable to see that. And we are unable to see that as the church. And we come in judgment over other people's lives and the tyrants that have come up in their own bodies exposed to us because they have been unable to preserve confidentiality and the way that sin and weakness and struggles have destroyed their bodies and their lives. And yet Jesus wants another way. Jesus says to the Pharisees in this moment, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what it means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you wouldn't have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus helps us to understand what um, John, was help, John was speaking last week about morals and ethics. That morals are, is a sense of right and wrong, and those are important. Ethics are the system of morals, how we take our system of morals and allow it to form our characters and our viewpoints, our disposition towards ourselves and towards others. And so in this case, Jesus is saying, you have, you've, you've read the morals, but you've forgotten the ethics. You've forgotten the disposition that it's not all about sacrifice. When we come to Jesus with a broken country of man's soul, so to speak, when we come to Jesus with our brokenness, he doesn't respond by asking for us to sacrifice our bodies, for asking for us to condemn them and to punish them and to, uh, to, to hate them. No, instead he responds by laying his life down in love and he asks us to do the same. I require mercy. In, in Hosea, where Jesus is quoting from, it actually says this word mercy is translated steadfast love. I require steadfast love not sacrifice. Can we love one another to wholeness, knowing that Jesus has laid down his life as a sacrifice? Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in us. If our bodies can be a temple of the Holy Spirit, then the most important thing that we can do for our bodies, that we can do for the country of Mansoul, the most important thing that we can do to look after ourselves is to open ourselves up to become a temple of the Holy Spirit. Because those who do not belong to Christ do not have the Spirit of Christ living within them. If you have not made a decision for Christ to be your King and Lord, then you not, do not yet have the Spirit of Christ living within you. But as soon as you make a decision to, to place your trust and your faith in Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, when you trust in him as your king and as your savior, then God's spirit comes to live in you. He turns your body that has been created by God, redeemed by Christ, into a temple of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't even say a house of the Holy Spirit, that, Christ, that the spirit of Christ is just living in us, but a temple of the Holy Spirit. A place where the spirit of God is valued, honored, worshipped, and revered. And so it is of utmost importance that this is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that we take care of it, that we let in what is good, we let in that what is pure. We do not profane this temple. The Holy Spirit will not leave us, but we are able to grieve him. And so would we, as we turn to our King, as we say we need help, there are areas of our lives upon occasion, and for, for most of us, there are areas within our bodies where tyrants rule, where we do not have governance, where the prime minister of our will is not able to exert, exert our will over gluttony, rest, drunkenness, restlessness, sloth, uh, uh, perversion, whatever it is that we are struggling to take control over, Jesus would love to come in as your king and to start with you, providing with you the bread of his presence for your journey and the, the sword that has been in your enemy's hand to be given into your hand as he walks you into wholeness. We have programs here in our church where we can go on a journey of emotional recovery. This is not a journey that we go on alone. David did not fight for his kingdom in isolation. He asked for bread for himself and those who are with him. And we have programs, sometimes within life groups that can be sufficient. Other times, if you need uh, more expert help, we have emotional recovery programs that are not just around addiction for drugs and alcohol, although we do have those, 
but also to go on a journey in any area where you feel that there are servants that should be servants within your life that are, are tyrannical leaders in your country of your soul and we can help you we can help each other as we acknowledge our brokenness as we come vulnerably together and so get hold of us if you would like to join one of those uh, recovery groups that meet regularly i just want to end with a moment that I had this week with two of my boys. They were reading the Bible as part of their school program. Both of them were reading different Bibles, sitting next to uh, me in the lounge, one on that couch and one here. And within seconds of each other, our 10 year old and my 11 year old both said, wow, oh my goodness, wow. And so I said, oh, what, what passage are you reading? What was said for you today? That your response was, wow, sure. And amazingly, they were reading this verse, I des desire mercy, not sacrifice. It was a different moment that Jesus was speaking about the, why he was hanging out with sinners and not with those who were righteous, who looked uh, perfect on the outside, but those who were broken. And Jesus said this, Matthew 9, verse 12 to 13, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. A 10-year-old and 11-year-old boy were wowed by the fact that Jesus was okay being with sinners and that he came as a doctor, not necessarily of physical bodies, but a doctor of our soul, a doctor that was able to write all parts of us and that he was okay hanging out with sinners. It freed two little boys this morning and they were wowed by the grace of God. I wonder if today you will allow yourself, as we close off, to be wowed again by the grace of God, that he does not judge you, he does not come uh, to point out where you have been exposed. If you are somebody who is able to be vulnerable while preserving your confidentiality, beautiful, and we encourage your vulnerability in our family. If you are one who vulnerability is going to require that you also have to give up your confidentiality because it will become obvious what is wrong with you. It will become obvious and you will be exposed. I promise you that me and I trust that those listening, that we will create a culture for you to be able to be exposed with great dignity, with great modesty, as we protect one another, the temple together, not just a temple, but as the temple, we will house the Holy Spirit and not grieve him as we honor one another on this journey of redeeming our worldview and seeing our bodies and each other's bodies rightly. Amen. I hope that this has been a blessing to you today. And as we go into the week, we have we love to be together. We meet together on a Wednesday to pray together. You are welcome. And if you would like to get hold of somebody because something today has struck, struck a chord in you, why don't you contact us on info at anthem.org.za so we can get hold of you, uh, so that you can get hold of us, but so that we can walk with you on a journey into recovery and into redeeming your own soul and body and spirit. Have a great week.